Hey, Sandy Shore here for smoothjazz.com global. And it's time once again for another No Messin session. Today, we are going to discuss getting your music to radio. This is a very big part of any musician's life. And it seems simple, right? You record it and you convert it and then you send it off to radio. You would be shocked at some of the things that we encounter here at smoothjazz.com because I think there's a step that gets missed. As beautiful as your song sounds and as gorgeous as your album cover or your single cover is, there's a lot of data and information internally that is not as sexy, not as pretty as it should be because believe it or not, that data communicates to not only the person receiving your music at the radio station, but also the computers that will ultimately play it for you. So I have invited with me today for this No Messin' session, Rowan Meert, who is smoothjazz.com's um, chart administrator and music director here. He works very closely with me. Um, for those of you who think we're just all women over here at smoothjazz.com, this is Rowan Meert, proving full-time that we do like boys. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Rowan. Thank you. And, uh, and we've allowed him time off the computer for a minute to, uh, to talk with us here. Also, back again is the Vice President of SmoothJazz.com and Director of Design, Donna K. Phillips. And uh, Donna is the mastermind behind um, our EDU section for artists right now. Uh, also, really working closely with Rowan on the um, interfacing between the MP3, ISRC, and this new term that's been buzzing about that people are super confused about global or audio fingerprinting with the global database, right? That's right. Okay, so we're gonna debunk some things today, guys, and we're gonna discuss the, from the basics to the nuts and bolts real quick. We'll make it super simple for you too. Rowan, I wanna start with you. Um, I wanna talk about metadata. Mm -hmm. what, what is that exactly? And what it, would you consider clean metadata on a song? Okay, um, so metadata is essentially information that's held within a file, so for a song. Um, and that's important because it gives all the information that you would need if you just had like a loose MP3 or even a WAV file on your computer um, so that you know who the artist is, the song title, the album, you know, when it was released, all of that stuff, that is all metadata. Um, and clean metadata is really simple. It's just accurate to the point and completely filled out um, metadata, which you would find in, you know, anything that you would buy on like iTunes or, you know, Google Play or anything like that. Those are the kinds of files that we're talking about in terms of having all of the information available when you buy it and you have it on your computer. And how do you do that at home? So like I'm an artist, right? I just re finished uh, recording. I've got the MP3 because we know MP3s go to radio for the most part. You don't send waves to radio for the most part, right? No. So waves uh, differ just a slight bit from MP3s because they don't actually hold as much metadata. They hold a little, but not a lot. But most of the time we're dealing with MP3s. So moving forward, I'm going to just assume we're talking about MP3s okay. for metadata. So the... What you would do with your MP3s once you have them is you would want to be able to edit the metadata, which you can pretty much do with any um, MP3 program that will play MP3. So iTunes, um, I want to imagine there's some PC variants of that as well, but anything proprietary. And what you will do is you'll look at your file and actually look at the um, information that's in there. So that's like if you were to right click on it and go to get more info, you should be able to see it just even from looking at what you're seeing on your screen and going, okay, I see an album name, an artist name, a, a title name, all that stuff. You just want to make sure that that's all in there. And if it's not, then you just go in and add it. And that's really the entire process. It's not very complicated. You just want to make sure that it's all there and that you're verifying that it's all there. And you can do that with pretty much anything. So. Now, um, Donna, I'm looking at you here on the Zoom screen, and I think you want to say something. Is that you want to talk about the the uh, right clicking to get to access it? I know Rowan's going to show us a visual yeah. in a moment, but is that what uh, you're thinking? Well, for Mac, for Mac people, you can still right click on a Mac mouse, but um, PC people mostly right click. 
but um, mainly I want, I, I, what Roland will explain is the MP3 players that you can do this in. Okay. Because we're mostly Mac people and we do this in iTunes. However, I know other people who are PC people do this um, in like uh, Windows, uh, the MP3 player. So I really want to talk about that because, you know, like for us, it's simple, but for the artist said, you know, for themselves, they'll say, yeah, I would make the data clean, but I don't know where to do it. Mm -hmm. And I also want to mention the fact that we, Roland, what would you say the percentages of not clean metadata that we receive on files daily? I would say 90 plus percent. So. And I'm going to, I want to point out over on this end, why that's not great because people in radio, it's not like 20 years ago when we had staff that could, you know, open our stuff for us and prepare it for radio. The program director sometimes is also the station owner on some of these stations. Uh, and he's also the guy writing all the copy and he's trying to make some money and he's answering all of his email and he's listening to all this music. So if you send dirty or unclean metadata, you're literally gonna bog him down for 10 minutes and or 15 and that's gonna cause a backup. Your song may not make it to the air um, as timely as you'd like because of that. So it's really important. And the reason we found this out was because radio stations let us know when we were sending out our, our music via our green stream blast, we didn't know about metadata either. And we were just taking the tracks from the artist and getting them ready for the green stream blast and sending them to radio. And a few of the stations got back to us eventually and said, I would play your music that you're sending, but I won't now, I won't until you clean up the metadata because when I upload it to my system, the way that you're sending it, there's literally no artist name, no song title, no release date, no album. So I have to sit and type it in. And if I have to sit and type it in, I'm not gonna play it. And I was shocked by that. So we straightened our act up immediately and Rowan was working with us then. And I went to him and said, can you take this over as a job? So I think we're the only um, marketing platform that does that for our clients, that clean up the metadata on every single track that comes in so that our radio station panel and beyond our own panel, they get clean metadata on every track that we send out. But I think we're the only ones that do that. Mm -hmm. Rowan, would you show us what that looks like in your um, diagram? Yeah, so let me go ahead and do that. And will this be a sample from iTunes? Um, yes, so okay. I'm gonna be using iTunes here. This is actually the work environment that I work in. So there's nothing fancy here. Um, Cause to go back to kind of what Donna was saying about us providing this, generally speaking, the people who do this kind of thing would be like the mastering engineer. So if like musicians are familiar with that term or that part of the process, um, but because so much stuff is being done, you know, independently these days, that, that step can be skipped. And oftentimes the mastering engineer might only be dealing with physical CDs. So then that still doesn't cover MP3s and metadata. So, okay. um, so I have three files here. Uh, these are clean files and I'm going to go over why they're clean and, you know, how you want to be able to present them. Um, so if you were to just take any of these MP3s and drag them in here. So right off the bat, we have some information here. I'm gonna just get some more information. And so how did you get there. Um, I hit Command I, but you can also just um, you can get song info just like that. There you go. So and this, so to, you need to remember with metadata, this is what's inside the file. This is not something that like the computer generated or something. This is like anyone who opens this file. This is the information they get. Um, so it's really, it's really straightforward. Um, I mean, I literally just did my taxes recently. So this is very similar. You just want to make sure everything's filled out. Um, because, you know, for instance, if things are missing, this is going to become kind of a mess because, um, if you don't know that what the album title is and there's no artwork to go with it, then, you know, good luck trying to figure that out just based on the title track. Um, and this is a pretty straightforward file because it's just one song, it's on an album, it's one artist, and it has a track number. Now, this is, this is something I'm going to spend a little time on because this is kind of important. So it's track seven of nine, which is important. So down here at the MP3, it says 07. And it also just says sway.mp3. So something to keep in mind with, MP, uh, with MP3s and metadata is 
what you're seeing here is the metadata. Metadata is not the title here. So this is literally just an indicator of what is this file, but the actual information is inside of it. So if you were to just do this, you know, like, oh, you know, this is actually not called Sway. This is called, you know, something else. Like, uh, I don't know, Highway 68, for instance. Get rid of it. I'm going to drag it in. Oh, look, it's still called Sway because the information hasn't changed. This is just the MP3 number. Because a lot of times I've seen people do that where they'll rename the MP3 thinking, oh, that's going to change the data. It doesn't. Oh, that's in fact, good to I'm going to make a point of this because what I end up doing once all this information is in, we'll say this is done, we're good to go. I'm going to go ahead and convert it, which is just kind of a fancy term for saying, make a new copy of this MP3, make sure all the information is in there. So here's the new copy. It's called sway.mp3, and it has the 07 there. So you see how it, the 07 is not in here. It's been put into the actual data, which is how it's able to figure out what's going on. So it seems complicated, but it really isn't. Really, the only thing that you need to keep in mind is that what you're seeing here needs to be correct. And if this is correct, and then you go ahead and convert it, or you talk to your mastering engineer, or whoever else is dealing with actually making this an MP3 file or reconverting it to an MP3, it'll come out correctly. That's and Rowan, Rowan, don't some of the files, uh, aren't they missing even the album cover, which all you have to do is drag and drop. And when you go into yeah. the artwork tab, you just drag and drop it in there. Yeah, so that's, that's another thing. Um, that's kind of the last bit. It's something that does get missed often. And to be, you know, to be kind of frank with it, it's sort of the last detail that I usually look at would be the album artwork. So that's something that, you know, so getting rid of it, it's empty here. We don't really want that. Yeah. Um, so if I were to, let's go ahead and just grab that. So if we were working with this, it's got no artwork. Yes, it is just as simple as I'm going to grab this JPEG, put it in there and then done. Absolutely. That's so cool. And, you know, as somebody who listens to these MP3s day in and day out, I like to see the cover. It, you know, you put a lot of work into your cover. Most people do anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be matching the music you're sending in. So if you don't provide that, then, you know, the radio station, DJs, programmers, whatever, they don't get to see what you've used as the visual aid, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's also part of the identifier from a graphic design standpoint, visuals couple with audio and a lot of times people will try to say the name of an artist or a song but they'll say oh the one with the dog on the cover you see so the visual is a way for people to to remember you so it is it's crucially important actually from my point of view that's exactly right and then let's real quick here um hit on naming convention yeah because th that's another one like you were saying uh, sometimes they'll just send the name of the song or they won't even put the band name on the uh, can, the file or, any, or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to just, um, I'm going to start over here. I'm going to show you what I'm used to seeing just as a, you know, way to compare. A lot of times what I'll see It'll be something like this. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah. So that's a lot of information we're missing, you know? Um, and then the problem with that is that unless you convey that information through, you know, an email or some other way, then you're going to, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made because now you have to start interpreting, which is half of what I do just dealing with these kinds of files. But that gets really, really dangerous, which is what I want to move on to now, which is I've got these two other files. And these are interesting because they have kind of some caveats here, but there's also some standards surrounding it. So this is a clean one, again, but it's, it's featuring some artists here. So we've got the song title, which has got to be, and it's featuring Althea Renee and Maria Antoinette. What I tend to see a lot is, Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wow. So that's, first of all, that's a problem because <laughs> um, we've got, a, we've got, you know, it's inconsistent and it's not correct because if I'm looking at this from, an, uh, from a metadata standpoint, I know the song is featuring Althea Renee and Marie Antoinette. I'm assuming that the artist for the album is Aaron Stevenson, but also fe featuring Althea Renee on all the tracks because that applies to the entire album. I mean, we could make it even more messy by doing <laughs> it right here. So, so here's the problem from, let's say you're the musician here if you send a file like this, no one's going to really know who or what is like really going on with this track. When at the end of the day, once we get rid of all this stuff, which is not necessary and not correct, all we need to know is that you have a one track on this album that is featuring two artists. That's it. That's it. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. And I this gets kind of uh, like messy because if you start attributing featured artists to an entire album by accident, then that artist is being put on every single track, even when they're not supposed to be, which can legally become a problem. That's exactly right. I think that's key right there, that this song features Althea Renee and Maria Antoinette, not the whole album. And I know Aaron doesn't have a full album just yet. This is a single. However, if she did, um, chances are very good that um, Althea and Maria's are, are not on every track, you know, mm -hmm. so you're confusing people. And then let's also draw the dot for everyone here. This will impact the charting as well. So you as a chart administrator, Rowan, um, you know, you're, you, this could confuse things on that level too. Once the song started to chart um, and if the metadata was incorrect, mm -hmm. then that could really screw up how how many spins they get because what if it's correct in some at some radio stations but not mm -hmm. at others and you know they they may may tie together with the ISRC which we'll get to in a moment yeah but if it's not clean you're setting the course for some disaster well it can get even worse even from a radio perspective because if you were to do this now we can suddenly have um, I'm going to assume this is just Aaron Stevenson but I don't I don't actually know that it's featuring these other artists and now we might have two tracks back to back that are from similar artists because that's right. I that information that's right that's a programming thing right there not everybody knows that in radio we rarely play two of the same artists back to back unless we're running a set so if we don't protect this song from all three artists aaron stevenson althea renee and maria antoinette the scheduling software may uh, go ahead and put Althea's, one of Althea's songs next, you know, and that's, that's not what we would consider good programming. Yeah. But I, mo moving I, on to ISRC. Uh, I'm oh, sorry, Donna. Sandy, I just want to jump in real quick before we leave this, this, uh, uh, this visual. The composer, I want to speak to that because if artists would learn to not only do their metadata for the charts and for radio, this is why artists don't get paid. Right here, that empty composer field we will not fill that out because we don't know who wrote your song. Mm -hmm. So it's not really part of this conversation, but it's something that while we're here, I just wanted to address. If they would fill, if the artist will fill out all of this metadata, they know who wrote the song. Mm -hmm. And if they license the song from someone else, they need to put the composer in there. If That's a good that, point. If That's they wrote really... the song, they need to put the composer because I'm going to tell you right now, just like the charts pick up this metadata and the stations pick it up, so does BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC, and it's sound exchange. And if you're not in here, you're not getting credit for your That's license. That's right, because otherwise we're going to put Dave Cause in there, and he's going to get your money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, I, have, I only have one more thing, but it's very, very similar to this, which can also cause confusion, is anytime you have an edit. So we have a song here by Nick Smith. This is a radio edit. This is the most typical thing that we'll see, especially for radio. The reason this is important is because if you don't designate this as a radio edit, we have no way of knowing that this is any different from the album version, which we would then have to go and figure out ourselves by listening, which most radio programmers will not spend time on. They'll assume that this is something that they already have and they're waiting on a radio edit now. So that's important to keep in mind, especially because you might not even have a track number for it because it's a single. It's maybe not even part of the album. 
And then if now getting into the ISRC conversation, which we're about to talk about, if we have a different track length on this radio edit, which is, you know, 100% of the time, basically, um, that could cause some problems down the line as well, because it's a different version. So you have to designate that. And again, that happens all in the track title. It doesn't go on the artist. It doesn't go under album. It doesn't go anywhere else. It always goes into the, the track title. That's where it belongs. That's right. And I do want to do another one of these sessions down the road um, on why radio edits? What are they for? Do you need them? And then also we can cover at that time more about the composer and the other side, maybe studio side too, guys, um, because there's just so much information that artists um, could benefit from, just the behind the scenes stuff that you may or may not know, you know? So Donna, the thank you very much, Rowan. This is great. Um, Donna, the magic question really here is, what is the difference between an ISRC and audio fingerprinting. And if you don't mind going one step below that, what exactly is an ISRC? An ISRC is the, what it stands for is International Standard Recording Codes. Um, this was set up decades ago, literally, um, it was to create a global database so that every song and radio edit or like a version of a song could be given a unique identifier. And there's actually um, a, a method to it. Um, we, we can tell an ISRC number from a QR code uh, sales number uh, that's put on the back of the CD. Some people will mistake those. Um, you can tell an ISRC code because it starts with letters. And um, for example, if someone's from Canada, it'll start with a CA. If they're from the US, it'll start with the US. So they identify the country, and then the numbers actually have significance. I don't need to get into that, but basically it's not a UPC code. It's um, an international standard recording code and it's put on the song when it's recorded. Uh, you can actually pay for it to be done through uh, CD Baby uh, or ISRC.com. You can go there, it's very affordable. It's like $2 per song to have it done. The reason it's important is because of what Rowan was just talking about. Um, if we were to, all of us in radio and charts and all of the various streaming platforms, if we were to try and identify a song based on the artist's name, which, or the title or the album title, it could all be spelled differently. So you can't rely on spelling. So they came up with this number that's irrefutable. It's the number for the song. That makes it easy for all of these different systems to talk to each other. We call it a handshake. So basically, we don't care if you took uh, Brendan Rothwell's song and you, by mistake, called him, you know, Brendan Roswell. We don't care because the number of his ISRC on that track is the same. So we know which song is really playing. And, and Brendan, becomes, would, Brendan would care though, Donna, but- Brendan would care, yeah. <laughs> yes. But, um, but the good news for Brendan is that someone might type in his name wrong and if, our chart, let's say, only relied upon that. Let's say it went out from a radio promoter that way. And uh, the radio stations uploaded the track. It, it was in the metadata. It went up wrong. And all of a sudden, now the spins are being reported to charts. Well, we could think, oh, there's a song by Brendan Roswell, but there's also one by Brendan Rothwell. Are they the same? We don't know. We would see by the ISRC number that it's exactly the same track. Someone must have misspelled it. Okay. So that's a safety for the artist. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, your ISRC, it, it is an absolute necessity. You will not get charting without it. All charts now are monitored. No one is uh, filling out a diary anymore. Um, so we're monitor We're all monitoring spins. We do it two ways. We do it through audio and through metadata. Again, that's another reason why metadata is so important. I think the billboard chart is metadata only. They're not doing audio monitoring. And I, I believe a few others are metadata. And so what they're doing is they're reading a playlist that gets put out over the internet via a URL, a link. So every playlist page on a website has a, a link at the top of the browser. What their systems do is they pull that link down for that station and they read what goes out from the station server on, you know, to the, to the listeners. And they had, you know, every website, for a radio station, we'll usually have a playlist or a now playing at least showing you the name of the artist and the album and the song that's playing at the time. What 
those charts are doing is reading that metadata and they're looking for that ISRC code uh, that's embedded in the file. And that's how they know what song spun at what time and who to attribute it to. Okay, okay. That's, that's one way charts work. However, this can be uh, the, a, a massive error can occur. And it probably is occurring, but no one digs deep to find out. You'd have to monitor it all the time to, to find out, but there's, there's, a, there's a fault in it. Um, we have had stations go down on the audio side. So no one's really listening to the radio station but the playlist continues to play in the background, right? So the computer's putting out the data, but the radio station and the songs are not being listened to because no one can access the audio. So it will register a spin for that song, but no one heard it. So it's like if a tree falls in the woods kind of a thing. <laughs> so you're saying that if a station is off the air, the audio has gone. However, the server is still uh, trying to play the station, like in other words, the server's working. Yeah. There's something in the audio chain that's not working. So the the album every time a song plays, it's displaying its cover metadata, whatever. And some of the charts are picking it up as a spin. However, the station's off the air. Yeah, the state the audio portion of the station can be off the air. Okay, so and that's where this fingerprinting is coming in. Yes, and and this we actually stumbled into this backwards because. The chart we wanted to come up with was we wanted to make it as foolproof as possible, as accurate as possible, uh, and, and as automated as possible so that there could be no changing of, you know, like, oh, I think I gave it this many spins. We wanted all that out of it. What we stumbled into was that audio monitoring is actually more accurate than metadata monitoring. And thank goodness, because metadata is very hard to keep clean, you know, if you don't have someone doing it for you all the time. So, um, what, what audio fingerprinting is, is that this was a technology that was developed more recently than the ISRC database. There is, however, a global database for audio fingerprinting. That's the audio side of not just the metadata side of a song. So the track has an audio signature to it. And in our EDU section on how charts work, we show you an actual picture of what looks like these random colors and lines. In every song, they can pick up not only um, tone, but tempo. And uh, I mean, every little audio facet of it is the unique identifier. And then they ba basically make an audio fingerprint, just like your fingerprint with your unique lines. It does that with the, it, it turns the audio into actual visual lines. And that so creates is, a fingerprint. Is that like the Shazam technology in a way? Yes, I think it was invented before Shazam, actually, but that was the consumer usage of it. We we all became familiar with it through Shazam. So guys, you've actually experienced this with our chart where a station has gone down and uh, or off the air, and um, but the server kept generating a playlist. Um, and so it was serving up songs that could be detected. And so... Um, smoothjazz.com's chart reported no spins on any of our current artists because the station was off the air, yet Billboard or another chart was able to report spins on, off the station because it was metadata based only, whereas uh, the audio fingerprinting that we use for accuracy was displaying nothing. So that became a little bit of a dilemma with the artist or the radio promoter, right? The radio, yeah. And it was the radio promoter that let me know and us wanting to, again, be very accurate. I had to dig down into it. So I went to the radio station in specific and the promoter had told me, I'm literally watching the song play. And I said, where are you watching it? And he said, the playlist on the radio station's website. And so I went to the, Radio station and said, we're not picking up any audio, but he, we, we can see the, the songs we played. And he, I said, could you just send me your log files from your automation system? And when he went to look at the log files, they weren't there. Uh -huh. And he said, oh, this, the audio didn't play, but the playlist kept displaying on the website. Okay, there you go. So that's how we found that this was an issue. And then we've discovered that, well, that would mean audio fingerprinting 
actually says the song played. Okay, this is good information, really good stuff. And um, I know artists are, who are watching right now are wondering, well, okay, outside of smoothjazz.com doing our audio fingerprinting, how, how can I do it if I want to? Like Rowan showed us how to do proper metadata. Can I also be responsible for you know my own audio fingerprinting? What's the answer to that? We know that BDS um, offers the service through radio promoters. I, I don't know if they do it um, directly to the artist, but I know that it seems to take weeks to have it show up in the global database. Whereas our service that we have access to, um, that uh, they can do it within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so what we do is everyone who works with us uh, in marketing their music and getting get ready for radio, we make that part of our service that we, we get it into the global database within 24 to 48 hours. And we have to couple it with the ISRC so if you don't yet have an ISRC assigned to the track, we can't do the audio fingerprint. So that's the first step is when you go through like a CD baby or um, I think uh, Grace Notes or SoundScan or something also sets up your music with all of the buying distribution sites or the streaming sites. Uh, they usually get an ISRC applied to the track. Um, and then, so what you want to do from there is either come to us, if you're going to work with us and we'll get your audio fingerprinting done. Uh, it's really hard to find it on your own. It, it is at this time, but you know, with all technology, everything changes and um, it, within time, I'm sure it'll be uh, perhaps readily available or through an engineer or studio producer or whatever. But right now, um, if you are concerned about, about um, getting your song audio fingerprinting printed, I should say, we, we can help you. Um, that is a service that we can provide even if you're not marketing your music with us. It's something we can turn around very quickly and you can reach us at smoothjazz.com. And we say, we say, don't be a ghost. And that's yeah. the way to think of it. Like if a lot of people get the ISRC and they think that's all they need. If you, if you think you're going on the charts with an ISRC without audio fingerprinting, all of the charts that do audio monitoring we literally won't hear you. You, yeah. you, you. you do not exist to us. Yeah. So we won't pick you up. So you have to have this done if you want to chart. Um, yeah. And, and now it's just a good thing to know to say, okay, I've done my song. I've gotten it out to distribution. I've got my ISRC applied to all my tracks. And now I've got to do my audio fingerprinting and then I'm ready to go. That's it. That's it. Well, we really appreciate your time, Rowan and Donna. Thank you so much for helping us dig in a little bit deeper here on why it's so important to make the back end of the music clean and just as beautiful as the audio and the cover itself. So thanks again, guys. I'll Thank let you, you get back. I'll let you get back to work. I know you're extremely busy these days. For smoothjazz.com global, I'm Sandy Shore. Thanks for joining us here on another edition of our No Messin session, just for you, the artist. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.